Splatoon or company to come. Basically, someone is always shooting while someone else is moving. It's the and, and this was actually a revolutionary concept because you know what that does is that increases the the likelihood of survival for that other element. Um, this can go down to in the U.S. Army what we call a buddy team movement, which is just two guys, which are a, a buddy team. One guy is shooting his M16, while the other guy picks up and runs backward or runs forward, depending. Um, so, so what is this called? Mission tactics, or this is so this is specifically called fire and maneuver, is what I was talking okay. about. But mission tactics is a little bit different. Mission tactics or Auftrag's tactique um, has to do with has to do with the fact that each sort of uh, each sort of level of command, um, the high command basically figures out, okay, we want something done to achieve X objective, and X achieving X objective is what's called the commander's intent. And what okay. that is, is basically, and I, I, I say this as much in my article called Decentralized Leadership, but um, basically, basically, uh, basically, it's, 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 let's say the high command, let's say, let's, let's, let's take a brigade. A brigade is about 3000 men. It's under the command of a colonel. Uh -huh. And let's say the general in command of the higher unit above this brigade tells the colonel, hey, you need to take Hill 62 and the surrounding area in order to advance our line forward x miles to achieve to support the offensive on nearby city yeah. and that's the commander's intent the commander's intent is take the hill take the surrounding area so our offensive on the nearby city could be supported now okay. the mission the mission he issues is um it could be something like you do a brigade advance um with first battalion second battalion and third battalion or something like that advancing here here and here and all this other stuff. But after, after he issues that mission, right? Basically here's, here's what I want you to do. And here is how I want you to do it or how I think the best way you can do it with your current, current um, resources and all that is. And so the Colonel issues that to the, or the general issues that to the Colonel. Um, and then the generals, he takes his hands off the It's now the Colonel's problem. So the Colonel, what he does upon being given that commander's intent in that mission puts together his own briefing that he then gives to the several lieutenant colonels that are in charge of a battalion sized force. And that's 500. The lieutenant colonel then puts to get for each of his own individual battalions, puts together his own plan and then gives it out to his captains in command of a company. That's uh, about hundred to 200 men. Then those captains get their company together. their four lieutenants who are in charge of their four platoons and give them a briefing. Those lieutenants then go to their platoons, which are all enlisted men, sergeants and the like, um, and this is at least in the American army at the German army. Okay. I will, I will cut you off there because <laughs> I started the three uh, stream three minutes ago. And even though army tactics is somewhat related to Prussia, of course, uh, this is after all a stream about Prussia at a certain point in a certain, well, point this is, time. well, this is, this is a Prussian conception. This was yes. invented by the Prussian military idea and then was adopted by the rest of, uh, the rest of Western militaries. No, definitely. And I think uh, we are also kind of nearing the point. I mean, the, the of course, we're following the book here, uh, Poison of Niedergang, which I recently learned actually does exist in English. I thought it didn't. Um, it just is called Prussia, the Iron Kingdom. That's why I didn't find any kind of English cognate at first. And when I looked up Christopher Clark and saw a book called The Iron Kingdom, I thought it was a different take on Prussia that he wrote in English because I don't know, I'm weird like that. Um, but yeah, if you actually want to read kind of what, what we're on about here, um, it's it's the book, The Iron Kingdom, which we more or less cover um, chapter by chapter. This is the sixth chapter. Clark kind of bu um, builds up to the person of Frederick II. So last time we looked at um, the religiosity of the Prussians. This time we look at kind of the powers, uh, the centers of power within Prussia. And we're all also giving our first teases at Frederick II, of course, the guy who also adorns the um, the uh, pro the pictures of the series, um, one of the most notable Prussians ever in history. And today we're kind of looking into the, let's say, a peripheral look into the country as it is, as he inherits it. Not going into too much depth, I, I kind of uh, thought about it, but I think it's just going to become uninteresting, frankly. But just kind of covering like central ideas that, that were happening at the time. And with me today is my friend Paul Fahrenheit, um, who has recently gotten a bit of a name of himself by um, arguing, 
emotionally or well not emotionally but arguing with um, a burning heart against a certain uh, salesman of woven fabrics so i'm happy <laughs> to happy to have him on here and to kind of feature his uh main source of autism military history and military theory uh together of course with the state that will become known for its military and which by voltaire who by the way is a total hack and shouldn't be believed in anything was called a uh an army with a state um so yeah i think we we'll definitely uh, get into it uh, or immediately get into it so um at the time uh, at which we're talking about and, and kind of uh remember back to the last streams we did oh also i might uh, have to add i'm sadly not with chris this time i hope he'll be back next time there were some issues uh, between us kind of like getting this thing scheduled he's he's, and... he's hung over his shit right now <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's probably what what it burns down to yeah um but yeah anyways so uh the first thing uh, we want to cover today are the cities um and this is really an interesting point uh, that, that kind of is going on in europe uh everywhere more or less to some degree um, and also is playing out in Prussia, um, is that, especially for uh, in the cities, but in the countries as a whole, there's kind of this formation of two competing cultural spheres, which is really um, exaggerated in the Protestant world, is, uh, especially, and you, we will see why in a second. So the uh, cultural spheres we see is the emergent citizenry, um, which are kind of their, their elites are the, what we would call the oligarchs, um, so successful merchants, guildsmen, businessmen, tradesmen, lower officials, not high officials, uh, those belong to the other side. Um, and here really, so, so things that abound are kind of like the concept of the honest merchant, the concept of like the upstanding righteous citizen. Um, there's like a lot of value in citizenry and, and uh, like uh, this idea of citizen morality. Um, they will... Um, adorn their churches um and this is the, the place where you really see the separation and this is also why it's more pronounced in protestant states um the churches will kind of become almost like um like spheres like cultural spheres that you either go to this church on sunday or you go to that church and um depending on what, what church you go to or depending on what social class you're in or what group you're in you go to a different church. So kind of like the citizenry has its own churches and they really become these citizen churches. So they over time become adorned with, um, for example, prominent guildsmen, with mayors, with um, just sometimes memorials to an entire guild. So everybody gets their name into the church. Uh, and, and again, like what is really happening here is that the church already like takes off the form of a, an instructing uh, religious institution and more becomes a only partially instructive and almost uh, and also very much projected into cultural institutions so the church doesn't really function like a town hall right which would be like the other end of ex like the other extreme which of course is completely let's say a receptive space to the people that make it up they they um kind of like adorn the town hall whichever way they want to and they put the names and whatever they want to in there um, the church is more than that, but um, it still kind of takes on this second character where the church becomes, especially for this, let's say, the citizenry class, a place of like uh, local community and local community organization. And then on the other side, we have the aristocratic class, the blue blood, the high officers, the princes, the high officials. Uh, many of their positions are actually protected by bloodlines, so you have to be part of the aristocracy to get in there otherwise you don't get a um you don't get a seat basically and they uh organize around the grand cathedrals uh this is not just happening in prussia this is also happening in other cities at the time in other states at the time and in the various prussian cities um is they kind of like are the let's say elite churches the church is actually usually larger and like higher up physically um so there is kind of this the separation and divide which we will uh, see in the various uh, aspects that we look at between the aristocratic elite and the kind of like uh citizenry that is kind of striving up and and building itself really so um the cities are are being held down at this time um there really is sort of a policy of of hemming in uh, the city world 
Um, so, for example, the just the pushes for absolutism that are going on at the time, uh, which we also covered in the in the last videos, and which also continue under Frederick II, though to a slightly lesser degree. Um, they do a lot to um, to kind of take away autonomy from the citizenry. And uh, what's also happening is that um, the uh, there's an excise tax um, that is levied upon citizens. The, the excise tax is a bit of a, let's say, debatable topic because there are actually um, ideas and and observations that say that they might have actually that it might have actually been uh, beneficial to the um, to the citizens and to their um, to the well-being of the cities, but um, overall, it's generally agreed upon that the excise tax also exists to kind of like disenfranchise the cities, especially because it was attempted to be uh, put on both the cities and the rural areas. But the uh, landed aristocracy actually successfully fended it off, which meant that the rural areas could produce for cheaper because their goods were taxed. So they kind of won out against the citizens there. And something, and, and I guess this is also something where you really uh, can come into, Paul, is that um, something that also majorly um, kind of creates the image of a city, uh, city in Prussia at this time is uh, the stationary, uh, like stationary armies. So the Prussian army, of course, we've already seen that it has been growing and growing and growing and it needs to be stationed somewhere, right? Because it's not like it just has a... Like, uh, uh, I don't know, an army camp somewhere or something. Uh, it, it's stationed in the city. So for most of the time, there's actually within cities uh, local soldiers stationed. And Paul, you are a stationed soldier at the time. <laughs> uh, um, hey, how much time do you spend in the service of the US military within a month? Would you be willing to share that? So I am not at all what you would uh, what 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 you would call the Prussian military at this particular time um the prussian military at the time specifically after the reforms of the individual we're going to talk about or at least his father frederick the first also known as the, the the soldier king um what he does is he is kind of part of this upswing of this wave of professionalizing armies in the uh 18th century the nascent sort of uh the nascent sort of core of what would later become professional armies goes all the way back to Kaiser Maximilian and the Landsnecks in the 15th century and the 16th century, um, gets further, gets further, uh, exacerbated in the 17th century during the 30 years war. Um, and then by the, by the 18th century, pretty much every nation in Europe has a professionalized full-time military. I am not in a professionalized full-time military, although I am legally a part of it. I am part of what's called the, the national guard in the United States. The equivalent concept in Germany is the Landwehr, the L-A-N-D-W-E-H-R, or sort of like this part-time militia uh, once a month or basically. Um, and this is this is how armies have almost always been throughout the entirety of existence was it was a very much a part-time thing and you were called up when you were needed, but otherwise you went about you went about your work. Um, you know, you were talking about the increase of taxes um on cities. And I think this is, you could very much, I'm sure you've talked about this in earlier streams. Um, you can very much compare this with the earlier sort of Holy Roman period during the Renaissance, where it seems that the entirety of Germany was centered around all of these cities at the expense of the surrounding countryside, places like Nuremberg and Magdeburg and, uh, and, and uh, Lübeck and all of the Hansa cities. Um, and this is kind of the, this is kind of it going the other way, I suppose. Um, it, it, especially in Prussia, because I'm a Prussia being a militaristic state, most militaristic states derive the majority of their recruits from the countryside, from farms. And, um, uh, the, the adoption of the Protestant church actually with church birth and death records in Protestant states, particularly in Prussia, um, leads to makes makes this a lot more feasible than it had been previously because the concept of records really wasn't that much of a thing within the Catholic Church at least not to the autistic levels the Germans did it but yes in during this period professionalized militaries being stationed in cities was a very common thing um, soldiers would do this as basically their nine to five job as we would call it today um, they would you know wake up they would go to their first assembly they would drill all day. Uh, marching in line, doing the famous Prussian goose step, 
technique, which was actually a means to, uh, it looks strange, but it was meant to keep lines coherent and uh, together. Because if you've ever walked in a line with a bunch of people, uh, there's all sorts of different heights and the tall people will go faster and the short people will fall behind and it'll jumble up. So the goose step is was created to basically ensure that everyone took basically the same size of step um, in order to keep the the lines of the uh, military theory of the day coherent. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, they were how you would imagine them in any sort of RPG. Uh, what RPGs don't get right, play, games like Skyrim and Oblivion having these full-time guards always on patrol, that wasn't really the case in medieval cities. You didn't really have that. You had like a watchman, sure, but you didn't have like uniformed guards patrolling the streets. That was that was what comes into being in the sort of in the 17th and the 18th centuries with these unified guards marching around the city, um, standing at guard posts and all this other stuff, basically keeping a semblance of order. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 um, in the modern day United States. That's not really the case because I'm a, other than places like Washington, D.C., where the Pentagon and all of these other forts have uh have their high command infrastructure where you'll see people in uniforms just as a part of your everyday the united states mostly limits its active duty military personnel to its military installations forts which are basically really cities unto themselves they have banks they have fast food restaurants they have housing neighborhoods all within the walls of the fort so it's mm -hmm. really it's really a parallel society in the united states but here so in, in in 18th century prussia they were kind of put together so I, I guess I, I should have, uh, it's a bit unfair that I didn't really specify um, the, p the time period we're talking about because it's just like up until Frederick II, including him in some parts. But um, this, what I really wanted to shine light on is exactly this becoming of a professional army because at this point we already have the size, let's say, of a professional army. But this idea of a, an army that has something to do every, like every hour of the day, that basically of the soldiers having a, what we could call a nine to five job doesn't really exist yet. So um, the soldiers stationed in the city actually have a huge effect because, well, they need to eat and their um, army job doesn't really make ends meet yet. So um, even though they do get compensated for drills, as I think you do as well, um, they don't actually um, have like enough compensation so that they could like really live off of it. And there's many interesting things that uh, kind of develop out of that. So the first thing I think that's something that I think is, is a bit stranger for Americans. Europeans might re like have a, let's say, a communal remembrance of that when you kind of talk to your grandparents or something, is that uh, in a household you have often more than uh, one family stationed within like the same apartment and stuff like that. And um, in the cities at the time, in the 18th century, for example, this was very, very common that you had other people living within your household except your own family. And um, not just in the, it's where people sometimes see it more often, this is outside on the countryside, right, where you have like a large countryside manor, and then all your, um, all the people who work on your farm also live in, let's say, other rooms in that manor. Um, but also within the cities, it's actually very common that people have like a large house where which they own, which they have their own uh, employees live in with them. And that's often part of a, an employee's compensation. And that is also part of uh, how they actually manage to get the soldiers somewhere. Because again, they don't have uh, real regimental camps yet. So they're just, just starting to get into being. So we see actually the first regimental camps outside of cities. But most of the soldiers are actually stationed within the cities, and this is simply by okay, find yourself someone who can you can whose roof you can live under, who can more or less stand you. Mostly the you know, unmarried soldiers. You hmm? know, it's interesting you mentioned this uh, the sort of quartering of soldiers. Yeah, quartering of soldiers was something practiced not just by Prussia, but by pretty much every single uh, every single European regime in the yes in the 18th century. Um, particularly England as well. And they did it, uh, they did it to um, an egregious extent in the American colonies. Um, I don't mean to relate America to this stream about Prussia, but you know, a lot of people don't understand that the third amendment of the United States constitution, an entire amendment, stuff like uh, uh, free speech, right to bear arms, all this other stuff. One of those amendments is uh, the government is not allowed to forcibly quarter soldiers 
in your house. So this mm. was this if this was a real like legitimate grievance a lot of people had, you know, not just in America, but in Prussia as well. Uh, you you would have these families who are like, well, you know, we don't want to house this soldier because that's another freaking mouth to feed and another bed that we can't use. But, you know, the government is quite literally pointing a gun at our head and saying, you need to do this. So there's not much we can do. Yeah. And um, exactly this quartering of soldiers is, uh, let's say, very um, influential in the development of the cities at the time. So, for example, the soldiers also work to kind of undermine the local guilds because you can hire soldiers as cheap labor and uh, they don't have any contracts and they will basically do more or less anything as long as you give them a roof over the head and something to eat. Then there's fights about having to station a soldier, having not to station a soldier. Um, that is something that isn't happening in Prussia. So there's, uh, as far as I know, um, no forced quartering of soldiers. Um, but what does happen, because quotas have to be filled, is you usually get some kind of like, I don't even know if it's like a monetary compensation or if it's like an honor status or something. Anyways, what the richer people end up doing is they very often start loaning out uh, or giving out money to poorer people to uh, take in the soldiers they would quarter so that um, you actually kind of make a bit of a buck by by quartering somebody else's soldiers and becoming, let's say, an impromptu hostel um, to, to all these guys. And again, the, the, the married soldiers usually already start living in barracks. The barracks are kind of like there for married soldiers because it's always a bit more of a problem of having like an entire married couple in your home. Um, for example, when they want to get intimate, uh, sometimes they already, or of course, they uh, start having children and so on and so forth. And like having a full family in your house, again, these are all mouths you have to feed at the end of the day. And of course, none of these people can uh, might be able to do the work you need. If you uh, run a certain workshop, for example, you can only use young guys and uh, their wives or their children, you can't use them. So the quarters are kind of like um, getting, um, are there for, for the married soldiery. And um, something that also is very interesting, I think, is that, of course, within the barracks, as we see with any kind of, or within the, amongst the soldiers, I guess, um, as we see with any kind of, like, in, uh, let's say, parallel society, because they, they are their own society as well, right? They, of course, know each other may, way better than they know the citizenry, even though there is still this, this um, combination going on, this symbiosis effect between a stationed, uh, a stationed army and a city. Um, but in this exchange um, between the soldiers, uh, you also start uh, to see an economy where they very often kind of start loaning out their guard duties to one another against compensation. So uh, you could actually see that soldiers... still happens, by the way. <laughs> we, yeah. we'll, we'll still straight up like, hey, man, I'll give you 50 bucks if you pull my it's called a C <laughs> it's called a CQ shift, which is basically like you have to stay up all night at the front desk of the barracks house or something like that and take all phone calls or see if anyone comes in or anything like that, just because you always need someone awake at all times within yeah. a military installation. And so you'll get slotted with it, but like, there's all sorts of deals that goes on. Like, Hey man, I'll, I'll, I'll buy you, uh, I'll buy you lunch for a week. If you do, if you take this shift for me or, Hey man, I've got a girl coming over. I'll give you 50 bucks if you take my CQ shift or something like that. Yeah. And all of this. So, so this means that of course, soldiers start trading off their shifts and their military duties, right? Which means they become more available and at usually the money they, they uh, get for that, they get from the city. So they become more available it's kind of like labor for the cities. So what this military stationing has as its effect, basically, is that it kind of like stirs up the city. We can almost think about it as kind of like putting a bit more heat under a pot. You know, it gives the city a bit more dynamics. And we will see again in the war between the cities, because the cities, even though they're, they're being very much screwed over in many ways, they're also being kind of helped in these indirect ways. And, and the stationing of armies, for example, is actually one of those ways which, which is, is to the uh, benefit of the cities as long as they can kind of keep everything managed. And all of this is, is under this, let's say, interesting guise of um, this, this oligarchy uh, and this upper class, which uh, kind of, um, especially in Prussia, is very, let's say, um, willing to make connections and willing to connect, for example, with government officials so that they can still kind of keep this murky, unruly um, underbelly to the cities where everything is what we would call nowadays maybe even corrupt, 
but of course also enables the dynamism that you need within the city, the ability to be entrepreneurial, the ability to make deals, the ability to be flexible, all of these things that run away when you kind of like become a, let's say, a centralized bureaucracy. And um, again, the the uptick and the uh, like the the inflow of the soldiery is uh, a major lubricant in this. Uh, for, on the one hand, kind of providing young, able-bodied men for various tasks, and on the other side, also kind of giving a an interesting connection point for the different classes, for the different straighters, to kind of get into contact with one another so that this is never really an, uh, let's say, complete uh, disentanglement between the classes, and so that the cities and the city's oligarchs, the, uh, good, uh, the, the successful merchants, the high tradesmen, so on and so forth, are all kind of able to more or less get their word in and kind of get to play around a bit with the rules to, um, let's say, under the table, um, still be able to to get a city going. Irony of ironies is that the army was the means of bringing the free market to Prussia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the next guys are kind of like the, let's say, the, the um, recruiting ground for the other side, and this is the landed aristocracy. And these are the famous Junkers of Prussia. They own about 60% of the land in Prussia. Um, do you have any ideas of comparable land ownerships by landed aristocracies in around the world at the time? So the Junkers really are, they're really comparable to what happens in England, what comes about in England in the 17th century and the 18th century, what you could call the gentry. Yes. Now, all of us are familiar with Evola's famous caste system and how you have the, the burghers slash merchants and then right above them are the warriors slash aristocrats. Well, in the, uh, in the early modern period leading up into the age of reason and then the age of the enlightenment, um, this interesting sort of class starts developing as a result of all the newfound wealth of colonialism, of new economic practices, of uh of just general increases of wealth increases in the availability of foodstuffs in prussia's case the um, uh, mass availability of the potato basically i think quadruples prussia's uh population um because it's 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 now a stable plant that can be grown in brandenburg soil which is some of the worst soil on the planet um <laughs> but in essence the gentry fills this interesting niche between the merchant caste and the uh, warrior caste, which very much does exist. Um, and it's and it's sort of the direct predecessor to what we can now call the middle class, uh, the middle class of the United States and the suburbia and all that. And they are generally, they generally come from around the, the lower nobility or really, really, really wealthy burger families. And they are what you would call men of high talent, but low birth who are able to sort of play the changing winds of the colonial of the colonization game of the reorganization of economic systems within um, uh, within European countries and to basically win for themselves some sort of societal status approaching nobility, but not necessarily there, but um, uh, but at least at least within that, at least within they could be accepted at dinner parties with them at that point. And the Junkers. The Junkers are very much, um, you, you, you will not be thinking like, you know, the Duke of Brunswick or the, the Duke of Saxony or whatever. I, I, I don't know what the official titles within the Prussian kingdom were, but um, uh, you're not thinking like high nobles, like super titled positions. These would be like the, like Freiherrs would be, would be, would be named. They would be, um, uh, they would be like sort of knight or baron level. Um, very much, um, very much oftentimes only ruling over single estates. Um, and, uh, and in essence, what they do is they provide like the gentry does, they provide the human stock for the growing, uh, professional officer corps within this professional military and, um, uh, increase the sort of competency required to operate within the military. Um, and so, so that's like, that's the general comparison you can make. And this is something that happens in every country in Europe. Um, in France, I think they're called the bourgeois, um, in I don't know what they're called in the Netherlands, but but you have an equivalent sort of class developing between the sort of uh, between the merchants and the aristocrats that kind of play both roles, fill both niches. Um, especially um, the analogy to England is very good because England is the only country um, at the time that has the a similar amount of land ownership. So uh, the Junkers own about sixty percent of the land 
in um, in Prussia and the English, where the uh, kind of English aristocracy, the English landed aristocracy, owns about fifty five percent. Whilst, for example, in Russia, similar roads own about fourteen percent. In France, similar roads own about twenty percent. So these are uh, way more, let's say, pronounced in these two countries um, than there are in many other European countries. And um, the name Juncker, by the way, it comes from uh, Jungherr in German. Uh, can you translate that for? Is your German good enough? Uh, Jungherr. Um, it it literally translates to um, a young sir. Uh, but young I man. Think young man. Young exactly. man. Exactly. Yeah. It's young man, and these are kind of second sons, uh, young men, kind of like adventurer types who used to. So their roots are second sons, uh, adventurer types, who uh, went over to the Eastern Dance. Um, East of, I think, the uh, Volga River, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to uh, take over Slavic lands during the medieval period. And um, in these conquests, they are rewarded usually with uh, part of the land that is, that is um, well, uh, conquered. <laughs> Sorry. So um, the land ownership amongst the Junkers is really uneven. Like some of these are actually more what we would think of as like upper aristocracy with marriages into uh, Polish or Swedish aristocracy. You know, there's like mate people amongst them, really powerful families with huge estates to their names. And there's also like, but like it's a Pareto distribution more or less. I, I would I would wager it's a Pareto distribution because that just seems natural. Uh, most of them actually own very small estates, usually like, like sometimes even just a few acres, acres or so and so forth. Um, so there's exactly this kind of like idea of of them, many of them being kind of of noble blood. Technically, they're all knights. They understand they they conceive of themselves as knights, um, and um, kind of as upper, let's say, an upper crust. Um, but really being not not really poor, but impoverished. Not not for example, well off enough to send their children anywhere to school or anything. And um, as we already saw in the last episode, I think the one before that, um, the reforms really recruit from these areas, and especially the young, like the the less um, powerful Junkers, really see this new opportunity within the military. Right. So the military schools um, give uh, a young Junker person a complete education. Uh, cadets learn writing, French, logic, history, geography, engineering, dancing, fencing, and drawing. Uh, so military sketching, basically. Um, they don't learn shooting because <laughs> they're actually the upper parts of the army. On the right hand, you actually see a Junker flag bearer. Um, so they are more of the, say, officer class. Then they don't really make up the common soldiery. Um, and for many of them, as as you said, it's kind of this this opportunity to to inst instantiate themselves as this um, official middle class, upper middle class type um, idea that is really coming about. And in this, again, they're also competing against uh, the city, which of course like naturally establishes itself with the with the guilds people and so on and so forth as the middle class, and is also the one would, could even call traditional middle class of the medieval world, where uh, guildsmen, for example, could be, become very prominent and very powerful. And that was one of the most common ways for a lowborn person to actually have any kind of influence in a state is that he would rise through the, through the guilds and thereby accrue a lot of wealth and be able to live off of that, become a wealthy landowner, become influential in the city, uh, become a wealthy merchant, so on and so forth. Um, the thing, the difference between the Junkers and the citizens, however, is that the Junkers are bad with money, and they are many, really many bad such cases amongst money. military members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which means the, that real quick, the, real quick, yeah. the stereotype amongst U.S. soldiers of going out and spending their entire bonus on a Dodge Charger and marrying a stripper <laughs> is as old as time. <laughs> like like yeah. like all like every soldier ever has been bad with money <laughs> yeah and the yunkers are no exception right and this i mean um because you mentioned evola before i think this time period if you really look into it it's kind of like it, it shows why evola really only makes you more stupid um <laughs> <laughs> because it it kind of goes directly against his kind of ideas of oh the warrior caste is like this and the uh, merchant castes like this and in this we see like the warrior and merchants for example they're very similar 
um, at this point in time. They kind of like they, they're really competing um, for for the same spot. And um, the Junkers at first they're kind of losing again because um, they just are bad with money. And their main like the, the, the their main trait is still um, being let's say a landowner, right? Even though they have this these military careers. Um, which of course are also compensated and are better compensated than let's say a normal soldier and this is also the the track that the um prof uh, uh, professionalization takes so these are already professional military men whilst most of the soldiers are still kind of like semi-professional soldiers um there still is like they're still mostly landowners and they're still kind of mostly let's say aspirational class um, so, but what this ends in is, is they kind of uh, run a uh, run of massive debts, and usually, or what what happens more and more is that wealthy citizens uh, wealthy citizens buy up their estates after they have to pawn them to uh, make good on their debts, so that uh, the citizenry more and more gets into a position to uh, well take over um, like uh, like uh, land outside of the cities basically, and um, to take over land ownership and to more or less displace the Junkers almost. And in fear of that, uh, they actually come up with a ingenious solution, which is fiscal policy and monetary policy. Um, and what they end up doing is they send up a lending institution that is specifically for Junkers, that is also state sponsors, and which of course the Junkers being themselves very shifty and uh, astute people are uh, relentlessly abused to their own benefit. Um, but it does have the added benefit that it kind of handles the loans it grants to the Junkers in such a way that they um, that they are able to, uh, for example, when they default, are able to kind of keep their land and are generally, uh, it generally kind of um, enables them to uh, survive as a class and survive as a as a royal class again because of course it's very important um, that they want to kind of remain their retain their loyal status and I think in this we also kind of see the um, the idea of of Prussia at the time so it's really trying to become this this military state and you have this aspirational military class that is kind of um, drawing up from the bottom of the Junkers, which again, like upper um, upper echelons of, of the military are completely blocked off to the citizenry, right? It's, it's understood that citizens uh, don't get to be there. You have to be of noble blood. You have to be a knight. And the Junkers are also kind of understanding themselves in that way. And we see a lot of that reverberate into our time today. And we will talk about that a bit later when we talk about, especially about Junker culture and how it influenced, let's say, uh, our common culture to this day. And again, also will disprove a bit of Evolian theory of history there because I can't stand the man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, next, uh, wait, can I, so next um, on the chopping block, I guess, are the farmers. Um, this is something that, uh, especially the Iron Kingdom, is a very good book for because it kind of, uh, is a, a an important point in breaking with the historical consensus. And in doing so, we can actually observe something that is very interesting for us today. Uh, but for, let, first, get, let, let me give a bit of background. So over the time, the Junkers, and again, they, they're themselves kind of shifty people, they gain more and more legal rights over the farmers and peasants. And something that um, dominates and that the Iron Kingdom really talks about and that is just fading away right now is a narrative of Junker tyranny. Basically, you know, the Junkers um, become these uh, autocrats. The, uh, their estates become like their own jurisdictions in which they <laughs> wield effectively absolute power, so on and so forth. And, and the peasants become more or less serfs, right? This is not true. This is somewhat true in some parts, but it has to do with something else. And that is actually that the Junkers here also are kind of clamoring for their status. Because the Junkers are really kind of, even though they they kind of have this ability in the in the military as a land owning aristocratic entity, they're kind of being phased out, right? The military is really kind of like their um, their ability to survive, and I mean it's it's a bit crass, but keep their dignity almost. So um, what happens is at this point, for example, the Junkers already 
uh, poorer than the and at a disadvantage against the um, against the king of Prussia. Um, we talked about in previous streams where the king of Prussia always had to lend his, himself money from his uh, local nobles, and the Junkers are definitely part of that and used to be a part of that. But at this point in the 18th century, the Junkers are usually more in the let's say uh, need of money rather than the um, rather than the sovereign. And again, the institutions uh, that are set up for the Junkers, specifically for the Junkers, are one of those ways in which this, let's say, lending direction actually reverses, because again, these institutions are state-sponsored. Um, so the Junkers actually kind of losing power, and we also see that with their peasants. So the peasants are kind of starting to, and the farmers are kind of starting to get uppity. And they're uh, doing things that, that they wouldn't have done before, and that especially like a beaten down serf wouldn't do. They sometimes do poor work intentionally. They sometimes refuse work. Um, the state has started issuing protection to farmers in certain ways and so on and so forth. So uh, more and more there's actually lawyers moving to the countryside where farmer is actually able to uh, really claim his own rights against his sovereign and against the Junker. Um, there's more and more free farmers that are moving somewhere that, for example, from the, um, from the citizenry or other ways of becoming free farmers, sometimes farmers or more and more farmers just become free. Or again, for example, when the Junker uses his, uh, loses, his, um, uh, loses his estates, there are sometimes opportunities for farmers to retain their, uh, to retain their estate, to rest retain their farm as more or less a free man now. Um, they win all these little fights against the Junkers, all the small fights. So the Junkers gaining more and more legal rights over the farmers, while it does happen, is more a reaction than a proactive move on the side of the Junkers. This is really a system and, and, and a class that is kind of on a downturn and seeking to protect itself. And the excesses of that are Junker tyranny, where somebody basically like holds on for dear life, and, and that is more how these tyrants form. And the reason we see that today, and we, we have this prevalent idea of Junker tyranny, really gives us uh, an insight about these kinds of dynamics in general. So, for example, nowadays we see uh, in, in the public consciousness, of course, not in our circuit, but in the public consciousness, you see a lot of um, ideas about, oh, the discrimination against certain minority groups in the United States, for example, right? And this has become louder and louder and louder. But what isn't happening is that they're getting more and more discriminated against, but that they're getting more and more power. And as they get more and more power and more and more ability to kind of, let's say, fight, um, these narratives actually start building up. And that is actually more or less happening in that space, in that time. So what we see is that everywhere where kind of like a, a really romantic sounding idea of evil tyranny starts rising up, is usually where the pr pr uh, proposed tyrant is on a downturn and is uh, someone who is kind of being pushed out or phased out. And remote instances of them trying to protect their, um, let's say, protect their former dignity and their former position um, are then kind of like interpreted as evil malice, uh, just trying to keep the little guy down. And again, the reason this this uh, narrative is able to surface at all is because now it, now the more empowered striving up class and the star striving up, um, let's say, group is able to really get themselves a voice that is heard by other people. And that is something we definitely need to take into account when we kind of look at different developments around the world, uh, different parts of history. Another part, for example, is the idea that in the 50s, uh, you have these like patriarchs or like 50s, 60s, you know, you have these old patriarchs uh, kind of like being very mean to their families. What happens there mostly, especially in the United States and elsewhere, is that family fathers are kind of being put under so much pressure that they can't perform that role effectively anymore. And so they kind of try to keep everything together uh, under much more stress, which uh, even like makes them act out. So yes, we do see that kind of behavior at that time, and people who kind of try to fight against that nowadays kind of try to pretend, oh no, in the 50s, nobody actually really hit their wives or something. This was way more common back then than it is today. That is very much true. But the reason, the underlying for that is really that the society at the time just disabled the ability of a family to work correctly. And it only happened 
uh, to be the way that the families were organized under the father to the degree to which they were so that the father felt it the most. And actually the reason why that is, is the one, is the thing we get to in the next slide. And I think we're already done on the farmers unless you have anything to say here. No, you're pretty exhaustive and, and correct about it. Most, uh, you know, the way to way to undo most narratives of history is to imagine history as like literally exactly the same as today, because the exact same issues are always present in all ages and all times. And uh, it is never it is never um, one way or another. It is never like, you know, oh, the, the, the nobles were so tyrannical in all places and all times and all this other stuff. No, it's pretty much everything is multifaceted and varied and there are certain trends. But for the most part, people just live their lives and did stuff normally, like pretty much all of human history. Uh, to quote a show we both, uh, both watched, in jeder Zeit, an jeder Ort, ist das Tun der Menschen das Gleiche. At each time and every place, the doing of man is the same. Um, and of course, that is the underlying philosophy of the show uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, who your uh, proposed last name, Fahrenheit, is derived from. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> out at you as do a, a stream. Do, do a stream as a do a stream about that. Well, no. So here's the thing that that's I know we we're about to go into sex and authority here. Very interesting topic. Um, but um, but uh, the reason that that's such a good anime is because it's actually not an anime. It's just an anime adaptation of a series of novels. And that is why it is good. Yeah, and, and the um, the idea behind it, again, it, it is this idea that uh, really, especially the social aspect, right, the, the behavior of man stays the same in, in every time and every place. So it kind of creates this imaginary place in the future. But unlike any other, um, any other sci or many other sci-fi stories, especially the ones that sadly became popular, it doesn't say that the future actually transforms humanity, but it just stresses this no doesn't matter how much progress you make, how much technological progress you make through history, people ultimately will still have the same fights, the same things. Like socially, we will behave the same. All of that has been figured out long ago. And it just projects our behavior of today into the future and shows how really you have these repeating, we can almost say cycles, although it's, it's not quite cycles, but these repeating patterns of history. And uh, most of them, again, result just from us being the same creatures. Um, at any time in any place. Okay, so sex and authority. Probably one of the most important parts um, for anybody who watches this in kind of, for example, from the United States or to kind of understand today's society. If you have a, um, a feminist person, and again, there's, uh, a, like we of course come from a, let's say a substrata that really envisions feminists as kind of like screechy fat women. Um, but we have to remember that this movement does have its own intellectual background. And um, this idea of the patriarchy isn't something that, like, let's say, they make up to, you know, uh, get over being uh, dumped by the third guy this week. Um, this <laughs> is the place where it starts. Um, the Juncker culture develops the idea of the patriarch, of the house father, they call it, who oversees the um, house and servants as a benevolent, I, I wrote autocrat here, I'm not really happy with that word, but I just want to give this kind of like idea of his, of his standing in the house. On the right side there, I put what is called a Juncker's home. Now, of course, this one, as far as I can see it, is not historical, but it's kind of the proportion of what we're talking about here, just to give an idea who the Junkers are, especially with their kind of escape into military matters. Most of them are kind of well off, right? I mean, again, like they're, they're kind of like the, the lower strata, but they're the lower strata of the upper class, right? So they're not like the lower Junkers aren't like you and me, oh, but they, they, um, <laughs> like they, or they aren't like, like, like the average person who watches this video, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they, they do live in, in rather nice houses. Again, they just can't um, really afford things like sending their kids abroad to study because back then that was very, very expensive. They're, uh, they're comparable to the southern aristocracy of the, uh, of the antebellum south in that they're a very cash poor people. They tend to have a bunch of land and a bunch of commodity value in their slaves and in their estates. But in terms of liquid assets, it's, you know, almost null. And so they're very frequently indebted. And exactly. So and I chose this house also to stress the Juncker influence on the United States. 
because this house is something you would see in the US. And it's not just in the southern states, in the northern states as well, especially in the northern states, which have the like the um, German ancestry, right? Um, a lot of that that culture, that, that Juncker derived culture, and again, many of the German immigrants, or I think even most of the German immigrants into the United States are from the north. Um, a lot of this culture sweeps over there with these people. So um, the idea of the house father of the uh, patriarch, house father just means literally father of the house, um, is that he is kind of the one who unites the family behind him. So at the time you have this idea of, of men being seen as active components and women being seen as passive components. Of course, if you have seen the main line of videos, I kind of outline how that works um, in, in what degree the male uh, element is always the uh, the, the uh, action component and how the female element is always the passive receiving component, um, which is something that, of course, we have kind of lost nowadays. Um, one of the interesting things, and, and the book is kind of like almost being a bit like sneering about it. I made um, this point in uh, made this point in my article today. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that we, the woman woman is order, man is chaos. If you, if you uh, understand order and chaos in the sense of order is stillness, chaos is movement. Um, actually, like, this is this is this uh, intertwines heavily with the things on the main channel, right? Um, because it, and this is, I guess, I, I, I'll spoil a bit of things here. In my last mainline video, I, I talked about the um, the uh, inner uh, the inner um, castle and the outer uh, outer forest. I think I called them, and um, the inner castle is actually in this in this conception. And again, watch the latest video on um, on a mapping of heaven to kind of understand what I'm getting here. At here is uh, the inner castle is the actually the feminine side, and the outer uh, forest is actually more the masculine side. Even though they sometimes switch roles, and especially masculine, however, is the idea and the guide who takes you outside into the forest. And leads you back in, right? Like the breaking, breaking down of, of boundaries. The, the guy who breaks down the boundaries. That's always a guy. It's always the masculine part. It's always the, um, and, and this is also something to keep in mind uh, for today, for nowadays, right? Where we look at, let's say, conservatives being, uh, let's say, called masculine, and um, progressives being called feminine. This is really just an inversion of of kind of like the, the gender roles. And if you kind of subscribe to that. Uh, you you very likely kind of subscribe to to what is more or less an inversion, because the female side is always the one that conserves, and the male side is always the one that pushes boundaries. And nowadays we just have turned upside down so much that we think that um, the female side actually do conserve um, what has been has been there before. They they more or less conserve John Lennon and and various influences that flew into that uh, are pushing any kind of boundaries when they're not. They're completely lost in chaos. And that the um, the other side is really uh, conserving anything when they aren't. They're pushing boundaries, but because they don't know that they are, um, they don't really have the will to kind of set up something new because they always think they need to conserve something old. Even though the quote unquote old thing they conserve isn't existent anymore, they just hold on to uh, like an ephemeral idea which has no presence. And that way they're also lost in chaos. So definitely something to keep in mind for today. A very interesting way this, and again, the book sneers at that, a very interesting way it kind of uh, is uh, showcased in Prussian society at the time is the way in which they go about um, uh, determining uh, things like unfaithfulness. And I'm not really agreeing with that 100%, uh, but it's still interesting. It's also funny because the kind of the book author kind of has to decry it as almost like a, a sexist. He doesn't really call it sexist, but he kind of makes this, you know, like sneering remarks like, oh, like this is nobody thought of this one. But he also kind of has to agree that's actually that was actually very much taking the woman into account and wasn't really like chauvinistic at all. They were like really trying to get to the get to the bottom of these things and they were really sincere. And the way they do it is that they um, see because they see the masculine component as as the one who's just who pushes everywhere, who's like let's say, eternally horny, which is the part I don't agree with. Um, but um, they see him as, as kind of like wanting to put it anywhere, basically. So they kind of look at the woman and they say, okay, um, because in this act of unfaithfulness, did he promise you anything, like a marriage, for example, you know, because they see the woman as defending, which uh, 
it's both is technically true. Like the, the, the guy is always the one who kind of like male and female uh, sexual strategies. They're not complementary. They're opposed to one another. He is the attacker. She's the defender, right? Uh, in, in like terms that have become popular through the manosphere and stuff like that, lock and key, right? Only that lock and key aren't made for one another. It's more like lock and lock picking lawyer, really. Um, <laughs> and basically what happens here is um, they ask the woman, okay, did he trick you by, by promising you something like a marriage? Or didn't he? And he didn't kind of means, you know, you just, you, you have a shitty lock. You let in any guy, you know? And if she <laughs> lets in any guy, if she lets in any guy, then it's not really his fault. Because again, he's like, you know, he's always wanting to get with a woman. So if she's being licentious, then it's not really his fault. If he did lie to her, however, it is his fault. And even though this, let's say, idea of men being perpetually horny uh, is something that I would say is also a bit of like, or is a misconception and something that is amiss here, the general notion of this idea of, of trying to find, let's say, the culprit in a, um, in a case of sexual licentiousness is, is way more intelligent than the consent-based system we have today because it, it takes into account much better the male and the female roles. A woman, a woman rather, without uh, discernment, and a woman without standards is useless. Yeah, and uh, what it also takes into account, what people don't like, and I think what the author also didn't notice is that nowadays we have this idea of of rape culture, and we have this massive war between the sexes about this, right? Well, there's even like like there's even this concept of marital rape that exists, and yeah, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but within a Christian marriage, I don't think there's any such thing as marital rape. It, it um, does exist. It does exist within Christian marriage, but this is not what I'm trying to get at. Um, and um, what I'm trying to get at is nowadays with this concept of rape culture and something that always has astounded me is that um, so Manosphy guys will vehemently protest when they kind of like they talk all about game and stuff like that and they're like oh yeah no yeah, I, I got a woman last day and then she complains afterwards and kind of calls you a rapist because you didn't commit to her and Manosphy guys will flip out about that it's like no, it was just a fling. I didn't rape you. You were willing at the time, so and so forth. Go back to this older idea of, of finding the culprit in this case. In Prussia, he would have been the guy who uh, would have gotten the sentence for that. Because with most of these women who have this kind of regret afterwards, the guy usually lies to them, right? Like, game often involves kind of leading the, way, uh, the woman on in a way to kind of get past her defenses. And um, of course, nowadays you wouldn't really like promise her a marriage because that would be weird. Um, but you do similar things. You Again, like you are engaged in deceiving the women and afterwards they feel betrayed, which is why they call rape afterwards. Because the, imp uh, the implied idea is that again, she defends herself against somebody else's offenses and then she opens herself to whom she's willing to. But the person she opened herself to wasn't actually the person she thought it, uh, who it was. So in that case, I very much am actually in agreement that people who went into a one-night stand, well, yeah, you kind of did rape the woman. Um, unless, of course, she's known for being licentious. And also one of the reasons this works and wouldn't really work today, which is kind of a sad reason, is that um, most of these cases are followed through and are persecuted mainly by the locals themselves. So um, really the, the village kind of knows the people involved. So they're kind of able to discern what's going on here. You know, like if, if it's like that chick over there, like, yeah, she puts up with anyone, like tough luck. But if it's like a, you know, for example, a young woman who's just looking for marriage and there's like this, disheveled soldier guy who's like perpetually horny and you're like yeah okay no he he definitely like used her goodwill and her belief in you know being with a good husband to to just get a one-up on her so yeah um that's something i wanted to put here um but there's a bit more so let's get through it so the yunkers again they, they kind of conceive of themselves as knights and um, this also plays into this idea of the house father. And again, in England at the time, in a very much comparable um, situation, you get this formation of the chevaliers and the idea of, of really just the chivalrous knight, the uh, many ideas of kind of like romanticism, knight romanticism, 
are being born at this time. You know, things like the Arthurian legends are slowly starting to gain traction again, um, especially in these kind of milieus. And um, all of this still at the time, however, is not quite as it would appear. So, uh, for example, women do actually free, uh, feature frequently within public life. They do own their own estates. Um, they do go into court battles, so on and so forth. It's not unheard of that women actually play a major role. Now, we did talk in previous streams about how in Prussia we are kind of have this loss of the female element. And that is happening. And the role of women is very much diminished to what, it, for example, was in the medieval world and what it is in, in Catholic cultures at the time. Um, but it's not gone yet. It's very important to note here because there's this easy idea of uh, this being kind of like a boys club. It's not. But uh, later through Theodor Fontanus and other remembrances of this time, this idea of the, of the house father really gets elevated into an idea and into something we would call from a, let's say, postmodern lens as something like simulacra, right? And that is how you get the, the real formation of what we can legitimately call patriarchy in the 19th and 20th century, where guys who are in very much different situations, because again, the house father idea, it's something of its own place of its own time. It's something that works um, because of the dynamics of Juncker culture at the time, um, because of the roles that masculine and feminine play, because in a dynamic environment, um, often the male is kind of, has to be kind of the ship captain. You know, um, doesn't really work in the 19th and 20th century, but people kind of still hold to that. And you get this full loss of the feminine element because you think, oh, kind of like the man is all, you know, he's like, he's all of it. And in that Junkers actually, uh, this influences the culture of the later Junkers. They, for example, not only become the kind of blueprint for um, many kind of, let's say, patriarchal communities, both in Germany and in the United States. So, for example, in my family, we do have family branches, which were organized as a very much meme patriarchal clan. You know, like uh, daddy sits at the end of the table when he doesn't want anybody speaking at the dinner table. They don't. And if he gets really upset with mommy, mommy gets it, gets it in the face. That does come out of this. Um, Something that also comes out of this interestingly, because again, look at the house on the right, these are not poor people, is kind of the idea of a frat boy. The frat boy is really something that develops in the region at the time, of course, not exclusively in, uh, in Germany alone, but the frat boys that you see nowadays, you know, with the nice shirts going to the Ivy League school because their dad did something great and they have enough money for it being relentlessly chauvinistic, you know, thinking that women... May I resemble just... that remark. <laughs> we, uh, thinking that women are just a series of, um, well, orifices. Um, that also kind of comes out of this overly patriarchal idea of, of Junker culture. And again, it's not really the tradition of the West. It's something that happens a bit later. So if you're looking at these sex fights nowadays, um, be a bit wary of the people who kind of like say, oh, actually, no, patriarchy is totally based. And uh, this is what we've had for so and so long. When it did work, and it did work in the idea of the house father, it was very different. And again, for example, one of the things about the house father, of course, is that the idea is way more Christian inspired than the later Theodor Fontana's idea. The house father is someone who, like Christ, gives himself for his family. He is an almost uh, martyr role for his family. You know, he takes on the blame, um, but none of the praise for it. Later, that just becomes a complete abolition of the female's role. And I think that is something that's very important to take into account. And again, something that is kind of happening right here, right now. Okay, I think uh, enough on that. Uh, do you have anything to say on this no. topic? No? No, nothing, nothing really. I mean, shit, like, like you've, got, you've got a very exhaustive analysis on these sort of things, and this seems to be your sort of wheelhouse. Um, I don't think too hard about women. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really, uh, 
you know, I, I, I kind of see them, I kind of see them as existing for a couple of purposes and I don't really think much beyond that. <laughs> okay. So you are more Junker inspired in your, in no, your I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a degenerate. Like I'm not like that. Like I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, sleeping around with a bunch of women is a generally good idea. Um, unfortunately it took experience to figure that out, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah. but you know, I mean, sexual history, which is its own historical field of scholarship, isn't something I'm, I'm really interested in. Uh, so I have, I have nothing really to add on that point. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Okay. So, uh, the last slide for today is, um, the book called the Prussian diligence, um, Difficult topic, especially because the chapter isn't really about Prussian diligence. So let's let's get some things out of uh, the ways first. I'm generally critical of the conception of Prussia uh, and kind of like the northern Protestant states as uh, more productive at the time. The term Prussian work ethic is something that develops uh, after World War II at a time at which it already isn't true anymore. <laughs> at which uh, within every country where you would call it Prussian work ethics, if you look at the uh, Protestant work ethics, if you look at the Catholics uh, within the country, they usually actually end up outperforming the local Protestant uh, populations. This includes the United States, Germany, and I think even uh, other countries like Netherlands and uh, not Sweden yet because they barely have any Catholics. Um, but of course, there is this idea of, of Prussians being extraordinary, uh, extraordinary diligent. And Frederick II definitely is a large proponent of this idea of uh, Prussian diligence. And something we have to take into account when we look at Prussian history is that um, history, I mean, there's this idea of history being written by the victors, right? Mostly true, definitely good, let's say, uh, easy approach to history. More specifically, it would be history is written by historian, which kind of sounds obvious, you know, yeah, of course, who else would be writing history, but, um, and even more precisely, history is written by whom it is written, which of course sounds even more obvious and even less insightful, but it's actually uh, gives us a very important, uh, let's say, standard to hold ourselves to, and that is, well, history isn't something which we have like an easy insight into. And Prussian history, for example, is mainly colored by um, the people at the time, many of whom kind of have an interest in portraying Frederick II and the Prussian people at the time is very good. For example, a um, guy we love to hate other than Julius Evola, Voltaire, um, he is in large parts responsible for the Prussian mythos and for this conception we have. Someone uh, who also features into this, who I hope to cover uh, more next time when we talk about Frederick and when I hope that Chris uh, won't be <laughs> in, in, uh, inconvenienced, um, is, uh, oh, no, I, I forget the name, uh, the reactionary writer um, or shooting Ni uh, Niagara. Uh, uh, Carlisle. Uh, Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, exactly. Excuse me. Um, he is. Uh, he writes a very, very prominent uh, auto or, or a very, very prominent biography on Frederick II. It's. It kindly... had absolutely no need to be seven volumes. And I, it's I not read. Really, yeah, you read I it. read all seven volumes. <laughs> you, you'll be there. You'll be the next episode then. You. You don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember like three quarters of it. Like, like yeah, it was all just, like, enough. it was all just tism. It, it, it's the kind of tism that you can only find in a Scot who's worshiping someone like, like, yeah. The other you, thing you, you about probably it, didn't even need to make it like two. You could, you could have made it maybe three or two volumes, but seven fucking volumes. He almost divorced his wife over it actually. <laughs> yeah. I, I did read, uh, read into Carlisle a bit and into his life. And yeah, that, that thing really like, it kind of took the life out of him. We can almost say it was kind of the dedication of his entire later life. It's not true, right? It largely contributes to Frederick the second's mythos. It's not true. The reason he writes it is more or less to kind of, so when you 
put forward, a, let's say, political opinion, right, which he does as a reactionary, um, you have to kind of be able to supply something. You know, it's it's easy to always be the critic, but you have to supply solutions. He kind of puts forth the mythos of Frederick II as, as almost something that Nietzsche does with his Ubermensch as a kind of like guiding idea for the English people and for reactionaries as, let's say, a better alternative to what they have going on at the time. The problem for that is with that is, is that he kind of really bends the character of Frederick into this idealized monarch that he never was to um, and and perhaps even never should have been because there's also, let's say, doubt about how uh, the veracity of, of Carlyle's idea at the end of the day. He was a good critic of democracy, definitely. I love his idea of, of comparing a state to a boat and, and kind of showcasing how it doesn't matter if the sailors agree. The things that reign over your country are the wind and the waves and the cliffs. Um, but he also had a large effect in kind of building this false conception of Frederick II. So again, a lot of the history, especially, especially around this time, uh, medieval Europe as well, is largely just false. Like the common conceptions are largely just false. Of course, the artifacts and the facts are all true, but the implications of them, the odds, are, are largely misleading. So I wouldn't put too much stock into this idea of Prussian diligence outside of something that people believed in at the time and kind of put out into the world. Why did they put it out into the world? We're entering the period of pre-industrialization. On the right-hand side, you kind of see an industrial, uh, let's say, um, I think this is fabric weaving con uh, contraption of the time. I think it's not from Prussia. I, I uh, tried to look up a Prussian one, but I couldn't find any. Um, but really what is happening is one of the things Frederick II wants to do is that he wants to, well, let's say, industrialize his country. Now, I hate to make a video game reference, but I will do a video game reference here to one that I think many people know, Europa Universalis 4. Um, if you play the game, you might have gone to a, uh, gotten to this point where the in, uh, industrialization is also just happening as, a, as an institution, I think. And before that, you build up a lot of manufactories in the hopes to spawn it. Everyone quits the game before that point. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Um, but if you somehow manage to weather through the boring there are later more, parts... There are more Europa Universalis 4 games that stop before the year 1600 than there are stars in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you if you somehow manage to weather through it, you build up a lot of manufacturers in order in hopes of uh, of getting the institution. Um, a lot of these mechanics are inspired by real historical events, including this one. So what happens is Frederick II really tries to get Prussian manufacturing into into high gear, and again he kind of believes in this idea of Prussian diligence, or maybe he doesn't. Maybe he just kind of like uh, preaches it out there and kind of like expects his people to become diligent in order to kind of fulfill these manufacturing roles. Or the third part is, is that maybe he just projects himself outwards. This is something um, which might become a bit clearer. Again, if you watch my last video, um, where I speak about how the mind works and how it kind of projects itself outwards. If you are a, and, and um, will also feature into things that I haven't really mentioned yet, something I only have, have um, said I would mention in the future called reality creation. But if you are a very, very diligent person, then it can appear to you that the people around you are actually more diligent than they are because you always see the world through your own lenses and through your own reality. So you kind of project yourself out. Also, because you're the king, you take up a special role in the minds of everybody else. And so in filling their pantheon in as an instructive and almost, let's say, superlative figure, um, you inspire people much more with your actions than other people do. So they seek to... Um, seek to copy you much more than they otherwise would do. Going back to the uh, previous slide on the house father, um, of course, uh, people coming into America, I said, uh, they very much live out this lifestyle as well. Well, you could ask, most of them aren't Junkers, correct. But by the Junkers doing this, their servants start doing it too, right? Inf influences like this fl flow mostly top down because always our superiors take up, again, the special role in our, uh, in our head that is somewhat aligned to parents and which we therefore unconsciously sometimes even, but often also just consciously 
uh, copy. So um, it might have also been the influence of the um, Prussian uh, rulers at the time that really made their people kind of strive to, to copy them and be uh, equally industrious. Either way, uh, Frederick II sets up a lot of these state-run businesses all over Prussia. And it's really something we can compare very, very well to China today, which of course sets also, uh, also sets up these state-sponsored bus state businesses. Uh, um, those are those are drastically overstated in prominence too. I, I think that actually, that's actually proving your point though about how retarded state-sponsored businesses are because they never yeah. <laughs> they're very rarely profitable. Now. Exactly, and exactly that's what happens in Prussia as well. Um, <laughs> Frederick II's entire endeavors they mostly fail, uh, or they have a questionable economic impact. So many of them are just uh, blanketly uh, unable to turn a profit. Um, others suffer from other things that we see often in planned economies, such as that they overproduce, right? So they could actually be profitable, um, or they even are uh, profitable, but they produce so much that they can't really sell it all. Um, so this isn't really a working economy, but um, this kind of entrepreneurial state still brings a certain A, dynamism into the country. And again, this dynamism also kind of um, gives the certain leeways and the certain outs that, that some people just need to kind of keep the whole machine running well, you know. There's always um, a book I really like, Hagakure, uh, a Japanese book by a daimyo to a son, which actually is, was supposed to be burned and not to be handed on, but it was so good that the sons kind of started handing it on uh, as a guide on how to be a, well, a lord, really, a feudal Japanese lord has this, um, this one insight, which is one of its most brilliant insights, where he says, you know, when you look at a lake um, and you look at the fish in the lake, you see how at the edge of the lake, there's like this, um, this wild growth. And the fish actually need this wild growth to, to lay their eggs and to kind of live. And if you remove the wild growth, all the fish die in the lake. And so it is with your country. Um, you can't supervise your entire country, otherwise your citizens just died like the f uh, fish in the lake do. There always needs to be this sort of veil of, of your own ignorance over your citizens, this sort of place where um, their own ideas can come into fruition, where even like uh, criminality is possible. Um, and that is something that is kind of agreed upon almost, like this, this, this empty space um, that you need to, to keep your society afloat. And all of these entrepreneurial ideas and, and these kind of like uh, shifts in, in money, really exchanging hands, gives all of these um, places outside of the spying eye of government and of, of let's say, the, uh, of, the, um, of the king, really, um, for, you know, this dynamism to take place that is just responsible and, and, and a vital part for any kind of civilization, as we also saw in the beginning with the soldiers. and. Um, so yeah, the state-spawned enterprises fail. They do have like a, let's say again, like a secondary impact. You also see that in, in bad ways, for example, in, in a similar situation, which doesn't really, in a similar situation of dynamics, let's say in the United States, you know, um, we associate things like the Gilded Age uh, also a lot with snake oil salesmen. Um, and that is also a part of this, uh, let's say, realm of opportunity that arises, but that again is very necessary for civilization to, um, to be successful. However, it leaves behind already built institutions. And I think this is also ultimately what China was kind of gambling on in their rapid rise towards industrialization and modernization of their industry. And that is that after the fallout um, and after the state protection is lifted on these businesses, even though most of them die, you have kind of a, a fertile soil for these new, um, these new pre-industrial uh, industries propping up. Because remember, before this, most production is just um, what people kind of do in their homestead, right? You get raw materials from the field, from the forests, and then you have homesteaded production. Some trades work in the cities and that's it. Um, so by kind of like layering the countries in like also the most obscure places somewhere in the countryside, somewhere in these uh, primitive manufactories, um, one of the effects this actually has is that a decent number of them survive and are able to become 
a beating heart for a new and renewed Prussia um, a bit later uh, that will be able to become a very industrious and easily industry uh, and, uh, and easily industrializable. I don't know, uh, an estate that has uh, fewer problems to industrialize. Let's put it that way. Okay, so I think we're one minute, uh, one hour and twenty minutes in. So let's do ten more minutes and then we we'll wrap this up. Outstanding. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've kind of been i kind of been quiet for most of this but just because it's like it's like you know you've you've got your you've got so so many prepared statements going on and i'm sure you've, you've put a lot of research into this and i'm like and it's like yeah and all this all this has to influence with the development of prussia prussia is a very interesting um although it is mythologized generally but prussia is the prussia's prominence is is almost one of the greatest accidents in history is it's like is it's like things just things just don't go so bad to collapse Prussia, even though they're, they're so close to making it, making it collapse in lots of instances. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think um, what really puts Prussia, um, let's say above and beyond it, what really made it uh, so successful in history. Uh, I mean, there's many contributing factors, right? Like there are actually many factors favoring Prussia. So for example, it's geographical situation is very good for it. Um, and then also, I mean, it is, especially keeping it geography, right? Like it is in a position where there's this power vacuum that emerges after the, uh, largely the decay of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, or it's depending on how you want to phrase it, maybe also just this, its focus on the on the southern parts um, because of course the north kind of like the south is is, is very dominant in the beginning and then uh, the north kind of starts to bloom we could almost say and now they have kind of disconnected again and and the empire is really just concentrated in the south but of course the power is now concentrated in two parts both the north and the south so there really is a place there for power to emerge and I think that's definitely something that, that speaks into the Prussian favor. But of course, there also is this element of just being, well, uh, we could say favored by God, favored by history, um, that that you just have to take into account. Otherwise, no country really makes it anywhere, right? And even though uh, I and we do use this um, uh, platform quite extensively to also dunk on Prussia, and to kind of point out many of its, let's say, flaws, that is in large part also just to dispel many mythos, uh, many myths about Prussia, because I think it's very important nowadays when I see people um, who kind of try to be traditionally minded, who uphold uh, Prussia as this paragon of, of uh, let's say, the old world's values and so on and so forth. I just want to give that pointer of that being a misnomer, but I also don't really want to portray Prussia as this pariah state who like you know spites god and creation through merely existing and uh you know like claws itself up in china the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man uh much there will be there will be then. there will be zero hatred there will be zero hatred of um uh of any European state, but there will be tons of hatred to China. <laughs> and India. We don't, I don't like India. I'm sorry. Um, I like India used to be great. India, India is an example. India was, I think, you know, I've got some esoteric theories, but India was a lesson that I think the Aryan man needed to learn, which is the fact that, um, uh, that even if he, even if he has almost godlike control over a locality, he can still melt into it and become just like the, uh, just like the brown people, like the, uh, the meme of the chocolate gorilla in the milk. I know you're Bhagavad Gita pilled and so on and so forth, but I would personally say everything that comes out of India is evil. <laughs> well, the Bhagavad Gita was actually the last, it was the death. It marked the death of the Aryan religion and not the birth of it, actually. Um, the Upanishads and the earlier Vedas are far closer to what we're, uh, what um, uh, what the Aryan faith in India actually was at its at its height. Don't like those either. I don't like Indian spirituality. Indian spirituality. We will actually cover this in this series as well. Is uh, we will kind of and and not exhaustively, but we will also hit on the influences of India coming in uh, 
coming into Europe much earlier than many people think. And um, they have always been very, very detrimental. And it's also something I personally want to warn against because every uh, part of um, the Indian, let's say, uh, of, of, of the Western world, which really becomes entrenched in Indian culture, collapse or it becomes a major hellhole not shortly after. The most recent example being uh, California, which was heavily marred in Indian and Eastern uh, culture. And of course, nowadays is kind of the United States first idea of, of what a failed United State might look like, right? I mean, with the people fleeing California because it is so dysfunctional of course on paper I, I guess on paper it still pulls its weight i think it's still the most profitable of the states but really like who wants to live there anymore okay cts in the in the chat saying brah um <laughs> i i of course <laughs> want to want to uh qualify here i'm only talking about india in a cultural and religious context and i am not talking about for example hypothetical indian women who have converted uh, to the true uh, to the true Christian faith? Who might be engaged to certain people in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that one. You I have the wrong to... guest on for that too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I also don't want to, do, <laughs> to dunk on any guests who I mean... might or might not have Indian-inspired art in their in their profile pictures. Um, okay, whose families converted to Catholicism? <laughs> so have to uh, have. Her entire province has been Catholic for 500 years. You see, and these people I don't have an issue with. I really take an issue with. Is, it, with is this Indian homie religion. engaged to a Goan? Is he yes. engaged to a chick from Goa? Oh, that's yes. that's rare. That's really rare. That's like that's like. Um, I need to find an equivalent example. Give me five seconds. I need to think of an equivalent example. That's like being engaged to a Brazilian from Rio Grande do Sul. That's like that's rare. Um, yeah, the 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 wedding is in six days. I'm going to be there. Oh, wonderful. I, yeah. hope you, I hope you have a very good time. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. But I think that marks the end of today's episode on Prussian history. I hope you all liked uh, liked it, liked watching, enjoyed watching. Um, <laughs> again, I didn't mean to disrespect uh, our Indians. I just meant to disrespect Indian culture. <laughs> Not all of it. Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, this always gets dicey. You know, being an internet racist is fun and all, but, but it gets dicey when your uh, sweeping statements kind of get interpreted in, in a way in which they're not meant to be. Um, and yeah, do you have anything final to say, Paul? Do you want to shill for anything? I mean, pretty much everyone knows where to find me. I'm not a hard man to find, you know, uh, at CavKingPaul on Twitter, Substack, paulfahrenheit.substack.com my telegram channel is hotel fahrenheit um you know i i have contrarian i i don't i don't even want to say contrarian i'm just i'm just like five years ahead of everyone else in terms of my takes <laughs> like my takes my takes always age very well is what i could say so you know i think if people enjoy my takes uh they're generally uh going to enjoy your takes as well i think we're very much on the same wavelength with many things um, so yeah, if you want a, uh, a, an ST aligned position that sadly hasn't come around to the Catholic faith yet, <laughs> you should definitely, um, check out Paul's Substack and, uh, pray for him that he may convert to the one true church. Yeah, I, I have converted to the one true church, the church that was founded by Augustine of Canterbury in the fifth century. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, it was wonderful to have you on. Uh, until maybe next time. Um, yeah. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. Bye-bye.